So this session is recorded. Um, this is this is a fully Zoom session where we're doing recording it here. When you're in the other workshops, that's going to be through Hublo. It'll be recorded through through that platform. Um, and it will be the recording will be available to you um, either through uh, CSHA's website or Hublo platform. That will let you know because we're trying to figure that out with the the Zoom only sessions. Um, the slides will be shared with you as well after the conference, the slides for this workshop. Um, feel free to use the chat function if you have questions. Also, if you didn't hear, if you joined us before um, uh, Leora announced it, if you can, if you haven't done so, in the chat, put your name, where you're from, your organization, and, and uh, what location. And that kind of gives us a great idea of, of who's, who's joining us today. Um, let's see, evaluations. So there's two evaluations. At the end, um, I'm going to give you a link to do the evaluation um, for this workshop. And then also each day, CSHA has an evaluation, which will be emailed to you. But I think it'll, you can also find it on the conference feed. And I think that is it. I have a handout that um, I will share with you. Um, but we have two amazing speakers today with the Pacific Southwest Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. We have Leora wolf Prusong and Oriana Edis. And they are going to have an amazing workshop with you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeannie. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Leora. She, hers, based in Los Angeles. Um, and we're going to do a full introduction in a second. But I just wanted to say um, to Jeannie and the whole team, I'm going to invite everyone who can and feels open to it to either put the clapping emoji or the hand waving like celebration emoji to Jeannie and team for putting on a virtual conference amidst all of this. So let's just start off with some acknowledgement. Uh, hand clapping, all the things, here we are. <laughs> yes, so I, I really want to start by saying Jeannie and team. So that's Sierra, that's Jessica, that's Amy, that's the whole um, California School-Based Health Alliance. Like what a feat it is to put on a conference when um, in, amidst this time. What a feat. So just wanted to start off with some acknowledgement, say thank you. Um, and before we do anything, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to just offer you that we have time this morning to get into a lot of good stuff. And there's a couple Zoom things that might help us all learn, connect, settle, and resource in this conversation. So the first thing is that in your view options, if you go full screen, you can click on um, view speaker and then minimize it to only have the speaker in your, in your box. <laughs> so that's one way that you can do it. You can also have um, thumbnails and the new um, Zoom update, which is so nice, and I'm just gonna have us on gallery so I can see you. The new Zoom update, actually you can click on the square and drag it to, for example, the top left. So Oriana and I will be speaking throughout um, our time together and hopefully all of us will be able to share, but there's a lot of ways that you can help um, manage your Zoom screen in order for us to stay resourced, located, and settled. And I want to invite all of you, um, if you don't, if you have water next to you, please, um, please get some water. Know that Oriana and I are going to be guiding our learning this morning. And also, um, if you need to go off screen and walk around and listen to us, do the dishes, take care of the thing, um, stretch it out, go upside down, little handstand action, whatever you need to do, please do it. There will take, um, we're aiming to take a break or between 10 or 10.15, so just have that highlighted. And we are aiming to do breakout sessions, which means that we have an invitation to you to move into small groups. And if video is not, video or audio is not where you're at, either technology bandwidth or emotional bandwidth, stay in the main room and we'll be able to dialogue there. So I just wanted to name that there are almost 200 of us in this room together. Uh, and, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown always says that our task is to find the conversation that only us in this room can have in this moment. So that's our work, right? I'm going to take a deep breath. 
I'm going to encourage all of us to take a deep breath too. Um, if you do have Zoom questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. You also know, um, should just know that if you click on chat and you're able to click on um, where it says everyone, you can either send a chat to me, you can send a chat to Oriana. Oriana, can you wave so that folks locate you? Yeah, <laughs> to Oriana. Um, and you can also send a chat to Jeannie if you have some tech issues that are coming up. Another way for us to know if you have some needs is if you click on participants, and you hover over your name, you can raise your hand. So right now, for example, Adina has their hand raised. That either means that you are clapping or you have something that you wanna say. So Adina, I'm gonna ask you, Adina Austin, do you have needs that need to be met? Or maybe that was the hand raised. No, I was just, no, I was just clapping. You're clapping. Okay, great. So Adina, if you actually, Adina is a great, um, that's a great model. So if you hover no, I was your, just clapping earlier. Yes. So if you model, um, if you hover your mouse and you can actually lower your hand, that's a way for us to know that your needs have been met. Okay. Um, so a couple things before we get started. One is that um, you will get all the handouts that you need. So you don't need this deck necessarily in order for our session together. And you do need the handout for this session. So if there is one, um, one download, it's a three page handout. That is something that we hope that you need. You don't need to panic right now. We're going to move through it later. Um, but hopefully Jeannie, if you can put the link again in the chat box, that will be really helpful for folks. Um, and and I see that Sunny is having also some issues with Google, with Google Chrome. Okay, so I'm just gonna invite you all to, as we're talking about school crisis leadership, I'm gonna invite you all to invoke a lot of patience and flexibility and adaptability with tech stuff, and we will figure it out together. The most important part is that we get to share and we get to resource one another in this really complicated and complex time. So on that note, I am going to share my screen uh, and we're gonna get started, everyone. So, um, all right, here we go. And Oriana, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen so I can? Yes, okay, lovely, thank you, thank you. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. <sighs> I just took a really deep breath because we're in virtual and we're new to each other and there's 200 folks and we're gonna talk about school mental health crisis leadership in a time when all of you are either reflecting on a pastime, literally in it in this very moment or are thinking about preparing for inevitable crises in the future. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and again, I just wanna invite you um, a court, you know, really, Oriana and I really mean this, to take care and move through this learning the way that you need to move through this learning. If it's for yourself, it's for, if it's for a colleague, or if it's for students that you serve. Um, I'm going to ask us all to be on mute as much as possible, and again, to use the chat box um, in order to resource one another. Um, and I'm really going to ask for us to, to practice a lot of um, considerate compassion and consent when in the chat box. So if you're finding yourself with the dialogue in the chat box, distracting yourself from the learning, then close the chat box so that you can, you can attune. And if you're finding yourself that the chat box feels more vibrant than the learning that's happening, go there. Do what you need in order to, in order to be. And so we are gonna start, uh, we, are, we are, my name is Leora, again, I'm with the Pacific Southwest MHTTC. I'm here with my um, fantastic new, shiny, brand new colleague, Oriana Ides, <laughs> who is our school mental health training specialist. Oriana is joining us and also is shadowing me today um, because this is really day two uh, on staff with us. And Oriana is gonna introduce herself in a little bit. Um, I do want to welcome you. I, as Rebecca and Meredith and many of you know, when I get excited, I tend to speak a little bit fast. So please let me know, private chat. Just give me a, a gentle cue to slow down. Um, and Oriana also has my consent to interrupt me at any point to do a pause moment. So we're all going to be in this together. Um, and, uh, and let's move forward. 
So I do, I do have to say this, that we are funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Um, and I just wanna name that we're incredibly grateful for the funding from SAMHSA and also that the views and opinions and content expressed do not necessarily reflect the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. So consider yourself disclaimed. That is, the, that is the disclaimer. Does anyone else need more disclaiming? Teresa, Vanessa, Stephanie, anyone? We're good? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Lovely. All right. This is the very tiny font screen. Many of you know this already. Um, the very tiny font screen that uh, just shows our network. So Oriana and I are here really for coming from two different projects. One is the TA Center and one is a new project. We're going to be sharing those resources in a little bit. Um, and the project, the TA Center that we come from is the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. We were funded in 2018 to provide no cost technical assistance to the school mental health workforce of the Pacific Southwest. So that's the US Pacific Islands, Hawaii, California, Nevada, and Arizona. So we're that number nine um, down in the bottom, uh, in the bottom. Uh, and that is all to say that um, we are here to provide guidance, tools, webinars, um, you know, in, in the pre-COVID life, in-person learning. And we have two tracks. The School Mental Health Body of Work has two tracks. The first track is on school mental health leadership and literacy. So we want to provide training and content that supports um, the world of education and the world of behavioral health and the world of child welfare and the world of community based organizations in, to interact with each other and to be able to understand each other's language. The second body of work, which is what brings us into conversation today, is um, work that we do around school violence and crisis prevention and intervention. Uh, and we partner with the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement to do that work. And that really houses all of our work around um, school systems uh, leading through big moments, which is what we're all doing today, engaged in conversation today. Um, and I just want to say a note about that, um, which is that our center, SAMHSA funds us mainly to support workforce development and systems interruption and change. So most of our work um, and all of you are here as a part of it, is really geared to provide no cost support to those who are leading, those who are leading, those who are doing, those who are serving, those who are on the ground, those concentric circles of care. Many of you on the call are in charge of really complicated systems. You're either in the middle of having to translate and then provide or, um, or having to uh, manage. And so um, that is what we're here in order to support. So. All to say, when you see those letters MHTTC at the back of my name, it just means Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Um, and we're going to move forward because who needs to look at this slide anymore? Not me. Let's move forward. Okay. The second project that we're here with today is the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project. It's a new project that Oriana and I are leading as well as in collaboration with Trauma Transformed. Uh, it's brand, 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 brand new. So if you haven't heard of it, it's because it's brand, 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 brand new. And it's a new project of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. It's a specific project for school communities who have experienced crisis and want to think about long-term recovery and renewal work. And we're going to be telling you more about that later on. Okay. So who am I? Who is this talking floating square head uh, in your computer screen? <laughs> Again, my name is Leora. I'm the lead uh, for the Pacific Southwest Mental Health TA Center. And I'm also the project director for the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project I'm based in LA, born and raised in San Francisco uh, and Oakland. Um, I'm a Mills Col Millsian College a teaching credential graduate. I don't know how many of you are from the Mills world up in Oakland. Uh, and my background is as a teacher, teacher educator, youth organizer, um, formerly in the college and career world, then in the school uh, mental health world. Um, and now I do a lot of intersectional work around bridging conversations between those of us that are in behavioral health, 
or are in um, are in primary care or are in schools or are in et cetera, et cetera. My passion point is bringing folks together because we all serve the same folks um, and figuring out how we can be interdependent and how we can be collaborative in this whole world um, called school mental health. So that's what brings me to this work. Um, and I wanna say one more thing before I toss it to Oriana to introduce herself. Um, my areas of passion, the things that I would like to spend a lot of time talking and learning and creating about are is educator mental health, grief in the workplace, racial justice and grief, and um, really honing in on how we can support those who support. So th that's what makes me wake up every morning and have a sense of urgency. I'm gonna pass it to Oriana to do an introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Leora said, I'm, I'm brand new to the organization, but not new to the work. Um, I'm a San Francisco born and raised, live in Oakland now. Um, most recently, I was the community schools manager in Oakland Unified School District, um, bringing um, community-based organizations into our school to provide quality and responsive services um, to support students, families, and teachers with a myriad of um, needs. I'm a longtime educator and a therapist as well, school-based therapist, and I feel deeply committed to um, creating space for us on the front lines to breathe, um, to take stock of the expertise and the, the extreme wealth of knowledge that exists um, within our individual work and collectively. And I'm really, really excited to be a part of this conversation and to um, support in any way a space for, for you all to um, you know, find the, the calm, the ease, the space that you need to, to really celebrate your work and to build um, collectively. So glad to be here. All right, thanks, Oriana. So what today might feel like, thank you, Oriana. What today might feel like, we're gonna start with some introductions and connection. We're then gonna double dive into what school mental health crisis means and what it feels like for us as leaders, the framework around readiness, response, recovery, and renewal, and then a closing. Um, and so all that to say, we have a short amount of time to be in really big conversation. So I wanna say upfront that I just named two resources, our center and our project that are gonna be continuing this conversation after 1115, because we know that this work um, is happening while we're in this room and will happen beyond this room. So this is our welcome, welcome to those of you who are joining us. Um, so this is the link. You can actually put, maybe Jeannie, you can help me and put this link in the chat box. This is where you can get both the guide and the um, reflection worksheet that this work is based on. Um, so if the Google link didn't work for you, this might. So our this conversation is based on a guide that we put out in June called the School Mental Health Crisis Leadership Lessons. And what we did, uh, I don't know how many of you need more toolkits in your life. What we decided instead of another toolkit is that we wanted to create a collection of storytelling and a collection of storytelling from leaders who were school-based, um, who were from the departments of education, who are school counselors, who are educators, who were students uh, from across our region around their leadership learning reflections through and after natural disasters, through and after um, school shootings, through and after suicide, through and after death of a student or an educator or an administrator. Um, and so this is a, uh, a, a guide that is a compilation of stories because that's one of the ways that we renew. That's one of the ways that we provide um, connection and reconnection after the narrative of ourselves has been disrupted by a big thing. So if you click on, um, if you click on the link, so bit.ly smh-crisis-leadership-lessons, you'll be able to get not only the guide, but also the reflection worksheet that we'll be working on through today. All right, so um, 
last but not least, before we do a little bit more grounding, I said this at the very beginning, but I want to offer this again for the 216, 17 of us in the room. Welcome, welcome, that uh, we're really offering you to take what you need, know that you're going to get the materials that you need. Yeah. Um, and speaking of which, if either Jeannie or Oriana can put the link into the chat box, that would be helpful. Uh, that whatever resonates in this moment is what you needed in this moment. Whatever resonates is what you needed in this moment. Um, and we know that this time of this intensive, this pre-conference is really limited, but the sense of urgency isn't. I'm going to just hold that. We know that. And I'm going to repeat this kind of now and always framing, right? Now and always. That when we talk about crisis leadership, we are talking about the now of COVID. We may be talking about the now of, um, of, the, of the resurgence and sharpness and acuity of raised consciousness and awareness of racial violence. We may be talking about the wildfires that many of us are navigating and holding, especially in California. And there's also the always that is, you know, I'm thinking of folks in Oakland today um, who are navigating through another student death um, related to community gun violence. I'm thinking about the way in which we all have experienced big things that are not held in this exact moment, but might be resurfacing and coming up and feel sharper. So that's the now and always. And I also want to hold that learning happens on three tracks and all of you have choice of how you want to engage in this learning today. For you as a person, you as Stephanie, you as McKenna, you as Jennifer, you as Andrea, I'm looking at the names, you as Brian, you as Lori. You might want to think about yourself in crisis in this moment. Beautiful. You might want to think of yourself in your professional role as school-based health center director, as an agency director, as a crisis counselor, also beautiful. And some of you facilitate this work. And so you just might want to watch how Oriana and I have set up the conversation, what you'd like to do differently, what you'd like to do similarly. So you have choice in how you navigate the conversation. Okay, so let's do a little bit of connection. I'm gonna invite everyone to either take a breath or rub shoulders. I'm gonna invite you to turn your head, if you would like, to turn your head to the right and gaze over and just see what's going on in the right side of the room. And then slowly turn your head and gaze what's going on in the left side of the room. Just checking out what's around you. And we're gonna put this quote up. Some of you have seen this before. Some of you are just seeing it first time. And I'm going to invite you in the chat box or with yourself, your choice, to share with us what comes up for you when you hear this quote. So I'm going to read it out loud. We're not supposed to spend our time living to heal. We're supposed to heal to live. And Kem Nadefo. We're not supposed to spend our time living to heal. We're supposed to heal to live. And Kem Nadefo. And if any of you have the handout, you can also use the notes in the back to track your learning during this workshop. So just take some time and you will let me know when I start to see some reflections in the chat box. What comes up for you when you hear this quote? Gina says mindfulness. Andrea, not to live in the past, but live in the present. Uh -huh, Anna, this feels next to impossible for nurses. Uh-huh. Yep. So many of us have roles where actually we do spend our time living to heal. <laughs> That's our professional task. Yep. Thank you. Lance is bringing up joy. How do we live in joy in this moment? Erica, reminder that we are not our trauma. We are not our trauma. Beautiful. <sighs> yes. Um, we need to heal from trauma and not carry it with us every day. Thank you. Mm. 
the importance of trauma-informed care. Sonia, thank you. Yeah. And we need to take care of ourselves before we take care of others, Naomi. And, and I think this moment is actually calling us to figure out how to do both at the same time, not sequentially, but both at the same time. Courtney is offering us collective and community healing. Yes, Christian, the wound is where the light gets in. Hafiz, that's true. Yeah, thank you. Rebecca, caring for the self and the collective, yes. Okay. So as you continue to put your reflections in, the reason that we start off here is that is that we really want to set the, the, the tone for the conversation around crisis leadership with the compassionate container that some of us, just like one of you mentioned as a nurse, some of us are professionally in the role of living to heal others. And, what, and some of us, because of the way um, either we've been because of the way of the context of our school communities or our workplaces, a lot of the energy gets focused on the thing that's right in front of us, the wound, the ouch, the harm. And what I am, what, what Oriana and I are inviting us today to think about is that the goal of crisis leadership is not the focus on the crisis. The goal is moving through and with and making meaning of the crisis. That is the leadership work. So how we can actually heal to live so that we can be alive. Yeah, Mar Marcial just said, crisis isn't me. Thank you, thank you, Ambrosia. Self-compassion and self-forgiveness. So I'm actually gonna move, um, I'm gonna move through, and Oriana, um, I'm just, I'm noting that for time purposes that I'm gonna move through. But I do wanna take, I do wanna invite you that um, we did also want to invite you to think about who you might literally or mentally thank for guiding you in this moment. So you do not have to put it in the chat box that is just literally one moment before we get started to give a moment of gratitude, Jeannie, whomever, who is guiding you in this moment. And just a moment of gratitude, of thanks. Thank you to an ancestor who taught you. Thank you to an ancestor who's giving you courage right now, a student who's maybe, whose who's will and whose spirit has led you, a teacher, a writer, a thought leader, who is guiding you in this moment. Um, Marcia's putting in the chat box. Thank you. Beautiful. Judith. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome to put in the chat box. You don't have to. You're welcome though. Who's guiding you in this moment? Okay. So with that, with that, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to move us forward. So I'm going to invite you, um, again, to do some sort of body motion that helps, you know, helps your body know that you're transitioning and learning. We've just kind of grounded ourselves. Some of you are still grounding. Um, some of you are like, why haven't we started this five minutes ago? All good. We're all here. And we're going to, um, we're going to start by thinking about crisis readiness, response, recovery, and renewal, and how we show up for each other in this moment. That is the essential question of this work. How do we show up for each other in this moment? And we are included in that each other. So some of you put self care in the chat box. Some of you named collective care. The whole work around crisis is that we know that it doesn't happen alone. It happens in the collective. The harm happens in the collective. The healing happens in the collective, both and, right? And so um, we're gonna spend a couple minutes thinking about what crisis readiness, response, recovery, and renewal feels like and looks like. I encourage you to put responses and reflections, um, things that you agree with, maybe things that you argue with in the chat box. Um, and then we'll have time to sit with each other in learning and think about what this means for our, what we're holding in this moment. All right. Can I get a thumbs up for folks that I can see on my screen? Thumbs up. Is that yes? Okay. If we were in person, I'd say check, and then all of y'all would say check, and then we'd feel the room, and then we'd move. Okay, great. Okay, so let's actually talk about what is a crisis. <laughs> what is a crisis, and how do we, when we're saying the word define, when we say the word crisis, what does that even mean? Um, and I want to be really clear that in this world, some of you might, um, might really know this, that the word crisis and the word trauma can both be exhausting and also empowering. There's a lot of folks who are done hearing the word trauma-informed care, who are done being told to be trauma-informed, who are done being told our story is one of trauma, 
and same with the word crisis. So the reason that we choose crisis and choose that word is a word to hold when harm, when an event exceeds the threshold of harm, when a big event exceeds the threshold of harm, exceeds our coping system, our collective coping system, and needs and requires different, more attuned attention. So crisis is defined in the federal government, of course, um, by certain events. But if we are putting a trauma-informed lens on this work, we know that events and crises are subjective. So I wanna be very clear with all of you today that if someone feels like something is a crisis or they are in crisis and relates to that word, then it is, then it is. And there are certain big events that because of our national skill set, national resourcing, and national validation require us to position it in the place of exceeding a threshold of harm, such as school shootings, such as uh, climate related um, disasters and, and, and wildfire, flood, tornado, et cetera, such as, um, such as many other different types of crises. And when I mentioned at the top, it could be a student death, it could be collective loss, it could be vicarious loss. It is up to you and your school community of how you identify the word crisis and what, you, what comes up for you when that word comes up for you. So I'm, I'm, I mean that very, very directly and I invite you in this moment to think about um, when you hear the word crisis, what does that mean for you? because all of our own personal lived experience with that word impacts and informs the way that we understand ourselves in the moment of crisis and understand others in a moment of crisis. Right? So with that, I wanna just take a moment for us to think about what school mental health crisis leadership could look like because that's what this session is about is thinking about if we think about crisis as an event moment or or cumulative experience that exceeds a threshold of harm then what does it mean to lead through that and i'm going to invite someone um, to unmute yourself and to read the font on the screen so that it's less of my voice <laughs> and more of yours um, so if someone either could raise your hand or literally in the chat box, just put your name and then you can unmute yourself. Oh, Amber, lovely. Thank you, Amber. Go for it. Unmute yourself. Let me make it wider because I can't actually see the whole thing. Here it goes. Uh, the individual collective organizational and systematic skills, knowledge and competencies based on awareness an acceptance of the responsibility and accountability to create school conditions, climates, and cultures that empowers others to navigate uncertainty and harm so that all students, staff, and partners can repair, regulate, and restore. Beautiful, thank you, Amber. So I'm gonna invite you in the chat box to put the phrase in this quote in this definition of school crisis leadership that's resonating for you right now? What is the phrase? It could be a word. It could be, uh, it could be three words. There are lots of words in this definition. So Pilar is saying repair, regulate, and restore. Ah, Katie's with you. Uh-huh. Andrea, empower others. Again, repair, regulate, and restore. Yvonne is saying collective. Adriana, empower. Sydney, awareness and acceptance. Yes. Lots of repair, regulate, and restore. That's so beautiful. Oriana saying, create school conditions. And Patricia, competencies and awareness. Yeah, school conditions, climates, and cultures. All three of those are very different. Not just school climate, but the conditions and the cultures. Selena, accountability. Yes, Ginger is saying, the Ginger K, empower others to navigate uncertainty. Empowering others to navigate uncertainty. Yeah. So continue to put your reflections. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add some more that if we know that one of the biggest things that comes up for us that can heighten a sense of, um, of trauma or a sense of an overwhelmed coping system is unpredictability 
and uncertainty, then wow, doesn't crisis lend itself so perfectly to potentially elevating folks' dysregulated collective nervous systems, right? And so part of the school crisis leader is that acceptance, the awareness and the acceptance that that is our role. And I just want to say, quite frankly, and I don't know how many of you will agree with this, if we were in a big room, we'd kind of raise our hands and figure that out. But when I was in my teaching credential program and my, um, my education doctoral program, we never talked about crisis. It was not something that came up. We weren't trained for it. We weren't um, held in navigating our own conversation. And how many of us as principals, as administration, as now as school-based health centers, as um, as leaders, are we learning through experience? Are we learning through um, what worked, what didn't work, what felt great, what did not feel great um, in, in moments? And so I really just want to hold that with compassion that many of us are having to backtrack learn and backtrack prepare. And that we know now in 2020, and we knew many years before, but we know now, bolded, highlighted, italicized, all the things that we need to accept that this is a part of our role. And if we do that, if we're at a district or county like many of you are, what kinds of skills and knowledge and conversations do we need to cultivate? Not just after something happens, but before something happens, after something happens, and in the long term. And it's for everyone. Yeah. Okay. So this is the framework of this conversation that we're going to be engaging in. So I just want to hold this definition um, and hold that it's very wordy because this one pointing to myself tends to be very wordy. Uh, and so if you are someone who doesn't need a lot of words, um, please make it your own. I really invite you to bring this definition back to your team and say, what would this, how does this definition land with us and how would we like to simplify it moving forward? Okay, so I'm gonna move through a couple things and then we're gonna have some time for reflection. So when we think about school mental health crisis leadership, we think about it being inclusive, complex, relational, individual and systems focused. That is so many different words. <laughs> inclusive, complex, relational and individual and systems focused. So I wanna start with inclusive first. A school crisis leader is again, is all, hmm, I'm gonna take a moment. A school crisis leader, from what we know from all of you and all the voices that have contributed to us learning about what, um, what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future, the inclusivity actually refers to keeping an eye and keeping the work and keeping the ear to those who will be most disenfranchised and most deeply affected in a crisis. So sometimes um, we can use the word equity, absolutely. We're using the word inclusive because crises have an incredible, have a credible power of elevating events that quickly disclude or quickly um, narrow our focus on one particular population versus others. And so an element, a skill of a school crisis leader is keeping that, that ear and mind to inclusivity particularly as it relates um, the inclusion of themselves in the crisis. Because many of us, especially I'm thinking about the wildfires right now, our own homes or our own livelihoods are also impacted while we are having to lead um, systems. So it's a double, it's including myself and leading myself as well as I'm leading others. We know that school mental health crisis leadership is complex. Um, we know that this work, there's no easy answer. And so I just wanna say that right off the bat, that if you're in this session, it's because you might be curious and open to knowing that you will not know. And knowing that you may not know what you don't know. And that for many of us who have letters after our name or who have positions in counties and districts and have people looking to us to know can really heighten and source and um, create big moments of deep vulnerability for us as leaders. So this work is complex and that's why it requires so many different partners in the work. 
so many different partners to help us come to solutions um, when we don't have the answers. Last two, and then we're going to get into some into some reflection. Of course, this work, and I know I say this to all of you, I'm looking at the names and I know that you know this, but I really offer us to know know this, that this work is relational. There is no way that we move through before, during, through, and in the long term without being in safe and rigorous and radically honest relationships. That means both with partners, it means both in the school community, it means with ourself, and it means with our loved ones at home. And then the last element of the school crisis leadership, and there's much more to this, I'm, going, I'm, I'm giving the highlight, the overview. The last element of this is individual and systems focused. So many of us have, um, because of our training, we may be more direct service providers. And we may think of crisis leadership as um, specifically supporting students or specifically supporting one person in crisis. And that might be true. We're actually thinking in this moment about how the system, mental health system, education system, district, county itself might actually contribute to the crisis and be an actor in the crisis. So it's a both and. School mental health crisis leadership is thinking about what do the people need and what does the system need to stop doing or do differently in order to meet the people's needs. And of course, we know <laughs> that it, we can't talk about school crisis leadership without bringing in trauma-informed principles. So sometimes I, I'm just, I'm saying this directly to the 220 folks in the room. Sometimes I hear the work around trauma-informed systems, services, or classrooms in a separate conversation than emergency management, or in a separate conversation than in crisis response. And I'm interested in how all of us might think about where those conversations can be in the same room and how we might be attuning to crises through trauma-informed lenses. So when we break into small groups, you'll have an opportunity to kind of piece out where that comes. But uh, I wanted to invite you that the most primary in a school crisis moment is safety, most primary. And I'm very clear that safety is subjective, that safety is constructed, and that safety feels differently for every different person based on identity, positionality, social determinants of health, et cetera, right? That the way that I have experienced safety is not the way that each of us have has experienced safety. And also that really nothing can happen until safety is established. So that's the part of the, um, of the response and the recovery work so that we can get to renewal, so that we can get back then into readiness, um, because we know that that's how the cycle of school crisis is feeling right now. Okay, so many words, Leora. I promise you, we're gonna, we're gonna break in a second. So um, these, this is, these are the reflection questions that I'm gonna invite you to think about and sit with. Um, I want to see amber your hand is still up maybe amber you'd feel open or maybe there's another voice that would feel open to reading some of these reflection questions out loud there's four reflection questions up on the screen so would someone be open to reading these out loud i don't mind reading it but i have oh, somebody okay. Else would, okay okay go for it amber okay thank you um what is your relationship to ambiguity to loss of control, to threat, a loss of regularity and normalcy? What is your personal relationship to crisis? How might that impact your professional relationship to crisis management and leadership? And how might your relationship and responsibility to information, first versus secondary responder, impact the way you become ready for a crisis or respond to one? And last, what is your personal narrative of crisis and how might that impact how you lead organizationally? Okay. Thank you. So all four of those questions could be a doctoral thesis. <laughs> the 
those are really, really big questions. Those are really, really big questions. Um, and I, I want to invite you in this moment to identify one of the four, one of the four that you feel open and generative in holding and thinking about for your own leadership practice. One of the four, you don't even have to name it, you don't have to put it in the chat box, you don't have to say it out loud, but to identify one of the four. I'm gonna give a moment for you to do that and then give me a thumbs up once you're ready to move forward, once you've identified. Give a couple more minutes. So I will say that as someone who's facilitated these conversations for years in different ways, systems, counties, cities, schools, school communities, that the, the last question is the most transformational question. The last question is the most transformational question. What is your personal narrative of crisis and how might that impact how you lead organizationally? Some of us might go straight to the deficit. This happened to me and that's why I can't see this. So that's why I get, I freeze when this happens or that's why I get stuck. And I'm gonna ask you to Pause on the deficit, because that's where we can go so easily, and go to the sources of strength and wisdom. That many of us have experienced things in our past, in our personal lives, that are the reasons that we're in this room right now, and the reasons that we're in this work right now. And most likely, we're hypervigilant, we're more attuned, we're more empathetic, and we have our eye on voices and bodies who have been and will be harmed because of how we've experienced harm in the past. So I'm gonna say that one more time. What is your personal narrative of crisis and how might that impact how you lead organizationally? This is a question that I hope I invite you to sit with. Um, and when you get into your breakouts, your small breakouts, you're welcome to bring that question to the forefront or you're also welcome to, to hold it in your, own, in, in your own time, in your own time. Isn't that funny in your own time? Who has their own time anymore? I don't even know what that phrase means. It's COVID. What are we talking about? 2020 in your own time. <laughs> okay, but hold it. All right. So the, the real last piece is that there are five big ways in which school crisis leadership needs to get better. <laughs> and the first is thinking about names and definitions. So if you get anything from this workshop, it might be that you go back to your school teams and you start to think about what does crisis mean to you? What does safety mean to you? What does an emergency mean to you? How are we defining and how are we calling it? And how do our students define it and how do our students call it? How do our students' families define it and our students and their families call it? And how might the way that we even name the thing either match or perpetuate where we might have a break in understanding a collective moment. So those of us who are um, leading school-based health centers, leading um, school districts, leading schools, we have power in the language we use. And language is an externalized signal of internalized belief systems. Right? So the way that we call the thing carries a lot of weight. There is weight in words. The second is equity, equality, and intersectionality. We cannot talk about crisis leadership without understanding the similarities and the differences between all three. So I'm, gonna, I'm really going to press us that those of us who might think that diversity, equity, and inclusion work or that anti-racism work is separate from crisis leadership, I'm gonna ask us to, no, 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 same, same. Part one, all together, intersectional, intersectional, intersectional. Right? 
The, the third is that roles and positions matter. So for those of us, some of us are in, uh, some of us will only be able to lead certain stages of the crisis readiness, recovery, response, and renewal work because we are in a leadership position that actually has maybe removed us from the folks that are experiencing harm. And so we have more space to think technically than folks who are serving a student family classroom who's experiencing acute loss and vice versa. So our roles and our positions really matter in how we think about um, really making sure that every stakeholder is elevated and actuated to move through the different stages of crisis readiness, recovery, uh, response, and renewal. And then last two, supporting the supporters. So I will say this as directly as I can say this, <laughs> that we cannot take care of our students and our families in crisis if we're not taking care of our educators and teachers and school counselors and school psychiatrists and principals and administration, the supporters of the supporters. So some of you know that that is an adage that you'll hear from me over and over again, but it is not just mine. That if you talk to anyone who's led through crisis, and we know this in the time of COVID, that, our, that many of the folks who are supporting the supporters are feeling it in different ways and are being asked to be crisis managers as they themselves are experiencing crisis. And the last but not least is partnership, partners and partnerships. So this work again cannot happen alone. And that's where I'm gonna end, end that piece. This work cannot happen alone. So all to say, um, I'm gonna invite you in the chat box to just take one moment of aha, one moment of reflection. One moment of reflection. And uh, and put something, a takeaway or an aha that's coming up for you, a takeaway or aha that's coming up for you. A takeaway or an aha that's coming up for you, something that resonated, something that was spicy, something that you like, you wanna, okay, if anything just happened, <laughs> that's the thing I don't wanna remember. Okay, Teresa, this work cannot be done alone, thank you. Hmm, everyone defines crisis differently. Thank you. Okay, make sure that you're, um, if you'd like to put in the all so that everyone can see it. Uh-huh, good, wait in words, thank you. Thank you. All right, supporting the supporters is getting a lot of good, a lot of good attention and good work. <laughs> All right, lovely. Okay, so we're gonna move ahead, continue to put your reflections. Um, and I am gonna invite you to, um, I'm, we're gonna try and move into a break um in a little bit if you're needing to stand up please turn your video off stretch yourself we're here you do what you got to do we're we're going to move through because we've got some stuff to move into before we move into breakouts okay taking a breath lovely okay so big graphic after all the big things <laughs> so i just i want to i want to pause here and then we're going to take time to go through them in a little bit more detail and then have time to discuss. So, so the piece to think about when we think about readiness, response, recovery, and renewal is that there is no way, no how. I do not want you to walk away with hearing or thinking that first I do readiness, then a thing happens, then I respond, then we recover, then we renew, then all good. <laughs> we know that many of you are recovering from something that happened and now responding to a new thing that happened. We also know that many of you are constantly in the response phase. Some of you might see readiness and renewal and think what a privilege, what a luxury readiness and renewal must be because I'm always in response and recovery. So I just want to be really clear that these, uh, it looks like stages because that's where I'm limited in my graphic design uh, capacity, but I'm not setting them up as stages. They all are happening often at the same time. 
So we know that we know that readiness is the thing that happens before a big thing. And readiness is the reflection on the past, what's happening now, and what will happen in the future. So we start to think about that definition of school crisis leader and uh, the awareness and acceptance. And that acceptance is that something will be happening and something will happen. And the focus of readiness is on competencies, collaboration, and communication. We also know that the next phase, right, if and when something big happens, and many of us are in this right now, the response phase, that is the during a big thing happening. The time frame is the present, and the role of a school crisis leader is protection and reduction of harm. Harm is already happening, so we're not preventing harm. We are reducing harm. We are mitigating panic and we're identifying harm tipping points. What might happen that will amplify or aggravate harm in a moment, in, in, in a big moment? And many of us are responding to death and grief in the response phase. The recovery phase is the weak or the month or the year after a big thing happens. The focus is on the past and the present. The skills are on connectedness and commonality. And the theme, and this is from Judith Herman's 1992 framework of recovery, the theme is on remembrance and mourning, re and reconnection and regulation. Remembrance, mourning, and reconnection with regulation. The renewal piece is what we then added. The renewal piece is the piece that many of us um, don't have the luxury or the time or the training or the resourcing for. And so the renewal piece is that a year after or more, three years, five years after a big thing. And the renewal piece is, whoop, I'm gonna go back, sorry. The renewal piece is concentrating on the present and the future and building and constructing a coherent narrative. What was the story of what happened with us, to us, at us, from us? And the theme of renewal is naming and navigating, normalizing, meaning making, and reimagining. Many of you are trauma informed facilitators, teachers, and providers. And we know that the body, the individual body, and the collective body, when a big thing happens, needs a coherent narrative a story of who we are and what happened in order to move forward. It's the most powerful healing mechanism. And that work then informs the readiness work. So readiness, response, recovery, and renewal. Some of you might choose to lead with a focus on readiness because that's your role and that's your responsibility. Some of you might want to engage your alumni in constructing renewal work because they are now sitting with a thing many years after a thing, making meaning, sometimes often by themselves. I will just say the last piece before we get to, um, before we get to discuss, the last piece that I want to really be clear about is, if we don't do the recovery and the renewal work, we are contributing potentially to collective destabilization. And we're in constant, constant response work constant, constant response work. That will wear a system, it will wear our nervous systems, it will wear our bodies, it will wear all of us out. We actually need to move into recovery and renewal, if not for a glimmer or a glimpse or a moment, in order to re-energize, resource and reallocate and come back to the work. Okay, so um, I'm seeing that Carla just said, I want to spend more energy on renewal post-crisis and making us more resilient. So I, I'm saying, thank you, Carla. That is, that is where um, we as a country really can grow. Um, and I really believe that because many of us are now more grief sensitive than we ever were before, that we have collective work in order to shift that forward. So I'm going to be really transparent. Um, you have in the slide deck, you have a, a couple of um, slides that build out readiness, build out response, build out recovery, and build out renewal. You have these as resources for you, and you also, at the very end, Oriana will walk us through where you can learn more about each stage. 
but I want to get us into small groups so that you have time to discuss and it's less Leora and more you. <laughs> so I'm going to invite Jeannie to come off mute. Um, and Jeannie, I'm just going to cue, well, actually, Jeannie, you can stay on mute, but I'm just going to cue you. If you can create um, breakout groups of no more than five to six people, no more than five to six people. And here's the invitation. Don't, don't set them up yet. Don't launch them yet. But the invitation for the breakout groups is you might want to go back to that reflection question that I introduced at the beginning. You could choose which R you want to focus on. Readiness, recovery, response, and renewal. You can, you have the worksheet. Where's my worksheet? So that you can then, hold on, now I've got lost all my papers. Okay, you have the reflection worksheet that has questions for every single R that can help you move through it. You could work quietly together and then share out. Or you could go totally rogue and use the time to process all the things that have come up for you. <laughs> that is my favorite way of doing a small breakout group. Just go rogue. But I'm hoping that you do have space and time to choose one or two R's that you would like to do more investigation and inquiry around and to share stories of leadership as much as you feel comfortable to do. So I just wanna do a choreography pause moment and see if there are questions or, um, or clarifying points about what I'm inviting folks to do in this moment. If you don't, remember, if you don't have audio or video and you don't wanna move into breakout, stay in the main room. Stay in the main room. Um, okay, so anyone in the chat box, anyone in the chat box have um, questions about what we're inviting you to do? Okay. Okay, so Jeannie, would you be willing to put the links one more time? And then if you can just come off mute and let me know that we're all set up for the breakout groups. Okay, yeah, let's see. I want to put, this is the link to the page. Thank and you. And I have, I have it ready to go. Five or six participants. Are we ready to go now? Yeah, so just before you launch, one more time, um, I'm going to stay in the main room and Oriana will stay in the main room. If you don't want to be on video, if you don't want to be on audio, I'm really going to encourage you to do that so you can meet and resource each other. You have that reflection question at the very beginning. What is your own, how does your personal relationship with crisis impact your professional leadership in crisis? Or you could choose an R, find the reflection questions associated with it, take some time and then share out. And we're gonna be in breakouts for about um, 12 minutes, 12 minutes. So that should be enough time at least to get some connection going, 12 minutes. So Oriana and I will stay, and then Jeannie is going to get us started. Thank you. Okay, so I put 12 minutes. Here we go. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll see you back in 12 minutes. Slowly joining. Yep. It ends up being like 34 groups or something like that. I know, I know. It's totally fine. Thank you. There's Two people unassigned. I'm not sure why. It's that probably me and Oriana. No, it's yes. um, Robin Turner, Monique Espana. There's a two P. I'm not sure how that happened. That's okay. So again, if you have a button up in front of you, please click it to see if you um, you can go into your room. So I think Monique probably. It looks like Monique needs to get replaced into a breakout room. Okay, and the rest of, I know some of you are staying in the room because you don't have audio video and that's okay. We're just gonna wait until everyone gets settled into their small rooms. Okay, so let me do that. Just 
put random. Okay. Oh yeah, Robin just joined. Okay, great. Okay. I'm just gonna randomly place you. All good. That's perfect. And so Oriana, that's actually perfect. So when people get back, we can move, you can move folks into um, share out on chat and then close. Or I'll be here to bring folks back and then I'll transition it to you. Does that work? Oriana, that works? Oh, you're muted. Okay. So there are about 80 of you still in the room. Um, and that either means you're choosing to stay here because you don't want to be in small breakout rooms or um, or you haven't clicked join your breakout room yet. <laughs> so that's a lot of folks to, to stay in the room and that is totally okay. Um, so I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite you right now. Let's just do a quick vote. Um, actually, let me, I'm going to pause before we do that. And Oriana, will you just watch time? So folks are going to come back. It's 1125. Folks are going to come back at around 1040. Three, right? Well, right now I have nine minutes left. Oh, um, that's probably 12 minutes. Took a long time for folks to get. Yeah, let's just bring folks back at, um, at 1040. Mm. Is that okay? Is there a way to override? Because I had set the time. Oh, you set a limit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Sal was in the room by themselves. Um, that may be because a lot of folks didn't join their rooms. Oh, no. So I'll, let's just see if Saul can get replaced. Thank you everyone for your patience while we get everything sorted. Okay, let me find if you are, I, I'm just gonna say this, that if you, are in, um, if you are in the main room, I'm going to invite you to take this time to use the reflection worksheet. So I can see some of you, Sydney, I can see you. Um, someone whose name is V Fuller, I don't know what your first name is. Um, but if you, have this time, you can use it to, to work through some of the reflection questions. Um, and I can actually go back to the reflection questions at the top if you want to spend time there. So yeah, can you can you go back to the first one, the first yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and it looks like there were a lot of folks who were in empty rooms. So Jeannie, can you I don't know. I can you help man help me manage the breakout yeah. room? It's hard because okay. I have to find find them, I guess, somehow and move them. I've never had to deal with this type of situation. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. It doesn't show everyone, so I don't know how to put someone okay. back in. Okay, let's let's use our time together and be flexible and adaptable. <laughs> Let us not be zoomed. Okay. So Sydney, so and so Denise and Sydney were both were in in their room alone. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so Denise and Sydney, I'm bringing up these general reflection questions, um, and let's um, use this time. Feel free to unmute and share out your reflection, and we can we can think about which question you'd like to work with. Um, you'd like to work with. It's up, it's up to you, Sydney and Denise and others. And feel free to put, if you do not want, if you don't have audio, that's why you're in this room, in the chat box, feel free to put your reflections as related to one of these questions or what's coming up for you. So what's coming up for folks as it relates to our conversation around crisis readiness, response, recovery, and renewal? So anyone want to offer in the chat box or unmute themselves? I'll unmute myself since I'll be quicker to speak with everyone than to type yeah. it in the chat. Um, but I guess I'm thinking 
um, mainly about the final question of the what is your personal narrative of crisis and how might that impact how you lead organizationally. And I'm, I'm from um, Napa, California, so we all know about what's going on there. And uh, kind of thinking about how year after year, as the fires come up and crisis begins in our community, how I'm quick to act and then maybe not so thoughtful about that um, before doing that. So thinking about how that might translate um, in, in a leading organizationally and being creating more um, space around that before jumping to the first thing. Yeah, thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Sydney. I think that connects to what Yvonne put in the chat box, this concept of control. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you also have a relationship with the word control. Hello, hello, that's me, control. And many of us have a relationship with control because we grew up in an unpredictable or overwhelming environment or had an unpredictable or overwhelming experience. And that's a way that we access and gain a sense of agency. And so I, I want to share as, as a leader to all of you in my own personal that that question around exactly Sydney, what you were elevating and what Yvonne is bringing up, working through the unknowns for myself and then leading through unknown can be really can be really overwhelming. Yeah. So I'm going to read some of the, the folks in the chat box and then um, and then check in with Jeannie to see how the groups are going. Let's see. Um, OK, so Marion is saying the personal questions are important because they point to the impact of crisis management over years and how to be more prepared to respond and prioritize the recovery and the renewal part. Thank you. Yes. Beautiful, Marion. And listen, I, you know, I don't know if there's any way for those of us to let you, well, you can, you can raise your hand, but how many of us also have developed really skillful disembodiment and dissociation skills? <laughs> when a big thing is happening to go out of the body, to be the responder, to be the fixer, to be the savior, to be the, and we don't have time to process what it means for us or why we're doing what we're doing. I think, yeah. um, I think this is Denise. <laughs> I, think I, can, I think I can speak to that. Um, so my personal relationship with um, my son being um, born with a really rare metabolic disorder and just like things were happening really quick, you know, suddenly he was in the NICU and then there was this and all, lots of things going on. He's 26 now and they didn't think he would live past three, but just, I think the best, what I kind of take from that experience and how I work with um, with students is, you know, there may, there, there may be a crisis, but it's like, sometimes it's important to just kind of take a breath and then like look at it. Because if you jump right in or at, react really quickly, then you miss the opportunity to do, to do well or to help the crisis. So I just kind of taught myself how to do that. It's easier said than done, but um, I just know with him, if I freaked out every time, you know, maybe, you know, he's in the hospital and his oxygen levels dropped or he was, you know, something was going on, then I missed the opportunity to learn how to help him better. And when, sometimes mm -hmm. when we freak out, then we freak out those around us. So if we are in leadership, then it's important for us to like, understand, you know, we're, we know that we're, our, our job or, you know, what we're doing, we didn't, may not know exactly what the crisis may be, but that there's potential that there's going to be one. Just kind of having that mindset and then being able to like, look at it and then decipher what what is it I need to do to help the student or what's the best thing I can do in the moment. Um, it's just been, it's been over time, it just kind of comes to you to, to respond that way. And I think that's helped, definitely helped my son and helped, you know, what, what's been going on, what has gone on around him to work more effectively. So just trying to, if we're in leadership, we know that this is our, this is our job and there's a potential that, whoo, something's going to happen, could happen. So we're kind of having that in our mindset and being able to like look at it and then and then move forward is most been more effective for me with like helping my son. And I try to use that with my students too. What a beautiful example and illustration of your own personal speaking to the professional, Denise. And the professional speaking to the personal, I'm sure, too. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read um 
Kameos. I hope I'm saying Kameo your name correctly. And if I'm not, let me know. Kameo says, when I feel threat, loss of control, ambiguity, I feel alert and hyper aware and needing to present a strong, competent presence. It creates self doubt and curiosity about my own narrative of needing to present myself as being in control to create a sense of consistency in my work with providers. What is that? That is gorgeous. <laughs> I can't even see you on my screen, but Kameo, that is like, that's so, what a beautiful and powerful and vulnerable reflection. Um, thank you so much for that. Yes, and Mallory is saying, I have been, I've gotten very good at compartmentalizing so that I don't feel too much after responding to crisis. I've learned it's not healthy and it is so important to acknowledge and be mindful when in the response mode to help our students. And Mallory, the piece that I will offer, and I know that we're gonna have folks coming back, the, the piece, the invitation I would have is to even watch the language that you're using about your, your own experience. And I would invite you to think beyond not healthy to what an incredible survival technique that you have developed <laughs> uh, over the years. And that compartmentalizing is a way of surviving. So even the language, the words we use have weight on ourselves also, right? Okay, welcome back, welcome back. I know that was so quick, welcome back. And thank you for those of you who are, um, who were in rooms of one or two people, <laughs> one or two people. Um, I'm actually gonna just hold it right here. Welcome back, I'm seeing some rooms close. And Jeannie, will you just let me know when we're all back together. I can't see the breakout rooms. Well, they've all closed, so. They've all closed, okay, so some of us are coming back together. Great, yeah. okay. So welcome back. Um, I'm gonna invite you in the chat box to share out one conversation piece, one nugget, one conversation piece that came up in your breakout room or in the main room one conversation piece. So it could be something that landed for you, something that you disagreed with, something that you agreed with. One nugget. So the invitation is in the chat box to take a moment to create a coherent narrative of the last 10 minutes of your life. <laughs> what is, that's all, not your whole life, just the last 10 minutes. Yes, yeah, so Brittany is saying, we discussed the challenges of connecting to parents to the discussion of suicide prevention. Yeah, and how much of that is such a crisis readiness and recovery and renewal, how often parents are in their own recovery space and we're asking them to think about response or, or readiness. Thank you, Brittany. Jessica, Jessica, you talked about readiness, preparing kids for the constant response and recovery stage they may experience at home or in other places. Ah, so Jessica's group brought up that some of this crisis readiness response recovery and renewal leadership will happen contained in your school communities. And some of it is um, developing the skills and knowledge of those you serve to navigate their own crisis leadership for themselves and their families and their communities. Um, all right, so let's talk about, so Amber said there was a great exchange about personal innate skills developed from our own relationships to trauma mm, that we tap into for the work that we do. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple more. So Anna is saying we discussed readiness and the importance of acknowledging skill sets and taking, oh, that just went up, skill sets and being aware of processes. Uh, and Darshi really heard the importance of taking care of the educator. And Ambrosia, the value of lived experience and using your story to engage family and staff to understand where families are coming from. Wow, what rich conversations in 12 minutes. Whoop. So good. Um, Liz, the importance of everyone knowing protocol and feeling like a team when addressing crisis. Yep, so if all the things create uncertainty for us as leaders, how might we actually mitigate and minimize the things that don't have to be uncertain so that we can navigate overwhelming experiences together? Okay. So again, if you're coming back into the whole group, we're inviting you to put in the chat box your golden nugget, your learning kernel from the breakout rooms. Your learning kernel from the breakout rooms. 
Um, I'm going to just see if there are any, is there anyone who would like to share out a question or reflection or pose a question or reflection at this moment? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Oh, I'll go. Lord, I, go hi. Yeah. yeah, in our group, we had a great discussion about how um, just whether we are in the medical profession or in the educational profession, that we're taught how to react, respond, and be ready in a moment of crisis. And we discussed how we're pretty good at that. Like we can focus and our job is to keep the children calm or keep our patients calm. Our, but what I found personally, it's later. My renewal pro process is a struggle because and now the high, that, that high, that adrenaline of getting us all through this safely or whatever the situation is, it's over and it's been solved and everything's fine, but I'm still reeling and processing. And I find that it, I struggle more at the end than in the actual event, if that makes That's sense. It not only makes sense, but you should hear, you should just watch all the bobbing heads that are resonating with you on the screen. <laughs> um, not only makes sense. So I want to offer two things to what Lori just, just named. Um, the first is that the reason why renewal is such a long process is because we don't have national conversation and discourse and attention and funding around that body of work, right? We think about postpartum. How does our culture even understand postpartum? six weeks, not very well, we know. <laughs> so if we even like drill it down to our basic culture, we've got room to grow. We also, I, I just wanted to, to offer that when, um, for my doctoral work, when I, I was interviewing educators uh, on the impact of student death on them, what happened to them, how did they experience when their students died, particularly due to gang and gun violence? And I had a teacher who had experienced 20 student deaths in his career and had never talked about them until we sat down together. And when I left, when I was leaving the room, I turned to him and I said, how, had this, how did this interview feel for you today? And he exhaled and he named every single student in that moment. And he said, I've never been able to say their names before. And now I feel like I can move forward right, 20 years later. And the other piece that I want to name is that in that study, I was doing statistical analysis about this whole adage of time heals all wounds. And it turned out that teachers who had experienced a student death three months before I interviewed them, or 20 years before I interviewed them, showed no statistical difference in their trauma self-reporting or resilience self-reporting, meaning that time was not the factor what was the factor? Being able to make meaning, being able to say folks' names, being able to mourn, being able to create a story with other people and then moving through it. So I want to say really clearly that the recovery and the renewal work feels wobbly because we as a collective are wobbly about it. And two, that if you are self-blaming or punishing yourself years later, I never actually tended to that thing that happened in my school community, it's not too late. It's not too late. It's never too late. Right. The last piece um, that I want to offer is that if we think many of you are nurses and many of you are primary care providers, and um, in our large group, someone brought up a personal relationship with NICU, the NICU. Um, and uh, on the side, on the side, I'm a birth doula. So sometimes I have a lot of interaction with NICUs. And if you have ever been in a hospital room, if you've ever been in a hospital room or a hospital, we know that many different roles serve different purposes in a person's um, healing and recovery journey, right? That when NICU nurses enter the room, they are there to take care of the baby and in that moment. And there are other nurses who are there to tend to the parent or the birthing person. And there are other roles to tend to the recovery and the postpartum. Do you see where I'm going? There are multiple roles at multiple stages. So that is a metaphor for what we in school communities 
can learn how to do. There are some of us that absolutely are responsible for the acute response and um, need to work and partner with other roles to take care of the whole experience and to attend to the whole experience. And I'm just seeing Naomi right now. So good to see you, Naomi. Naomi Blaine, good to see you. Okay. Anyone else wanted to share out a question or reflection before we shift? Question or reflection? So I'm gonna invite you in the chat box. Um, we're gonna move forward. Um, and we're gonna think about what our next steps are. <laughs> uh, and then I'm gonna transition out actually to another workshop and Oriana's gonna take us and steer us home. <laughs> so just to navigate some unpredictability, here are the predictable things that are happening in the next 15 minutes of our collective experience. Um, so I want us to think about the, the what, the so what, and the so now what, right? What is one piece that you would like to walk away this with this that with which you would like to walk away this? Wow, hold on one second. That what's the sentence I'm trying to say? What is one piece that you want to leave this workshop holding on to? So what? How is that going to impact the way that you show up at work later today or tomorrow? And then the so now what is how does that then really change the way that you might need to ask for support or support others differently or similarly? Some of you just got a lot of validation um, for your work. <laughs> so what is the what, so what, and now what? And I'm gonna invite you to take a quiet moment, take a piece of paper out on the Google Notes, wherever it is, maybe it's at the back of your reflection worksheet in the notes section, to jot down the what, so what, and now what? And you're also welcome to put it in the chat. We really learn from each other. What did you take away? So what? Why is that important? And so now what? What will you do with that learning? And feel free to share out loud too. What, so what, and now what? Anna saying, what? It's normal and okay to experience crisis as a provider. <sighs> mm -hmm. Gloria is thinking about revisiting the different stages. Yep. Marcial the guides and being mindful of the language that you use with yourself and others. Beautiful, that's the what, yes. What is the learning? So what, why is that important? And so now what, what will you do with that learning? Rosanna, take all the time needed for recovering renewal and create shared narrative. Yes, thank you, Rosanna, thank you. Rosanna, Rosanna, Rosanna. Ah, Lori, don't pressure yourself to be the rock during the entire crisis recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Erica, seek support from colleagues during crisis. I don't have to do it alone. Lindsay, time does not heal all wounds, but meaning making does, or could, or might. <laughs> So now what? Uh, make sure I ask for help. It can be as simple as talking about it. That's right. And Oriana is going to introduce in a little bit um, spaces that we're creating through the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project uh, for you to talk about it. Because the other piece too we know is that we have to be judicious and attuned with whom we process and with whom we talk about what we're experiencing. Right. 
Um, Jet is saying, sometimes it's the intensity of the healing experience and not the time itself. I mean, Oriana, can we just talk about all the golden nuggets that folks are dropping in the chat box? <laughs> this is like, oh my God, I want to put these up all over my apartment. Yeah. Okay. What, so what, and now what? All right, um, Asuncion is saying the what? Public health means to collaborate with school leadership to reach out to our child adolescent health object, to reach our child and adolescent health objectives. The so what? Stop working in silos. So now what? Contact our school and, and propose collaboration. Uh, 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 uh. I don't have D'Angelo as my soundtrack right now, but yes, cosine, highlight, star. Okay, beautiful, thank you. Okay, so continue to put your what, so what, and now what. I'm gonna say a couple more words um, here, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Oriana to close, and Oriana will close us out um, talking about resources and ways that we can support you to move this conversation forward. So I think the piece that I wanna offer is that um, there are many different ways for us as leaders to kind of wrap our heads around this work. And I find that um, alliteration really helps me. <laughs> recovery, response, re re you know, readiness, recovery, response, renewal. So Trauma Transformed, with whom we partner for the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project, came up with five Cs. And you can see the link is at the bottom, clinical guidelines for COVID-19 response. And we expanded them. So again, if there is one thing that you took away from, or one thing that you might take away from this conversation, here are a couple um, findings that we've learned in this time and in other times around crisis leadership. The communication matters connection deeply matters, even in this virtual space. The context matters. So right, we mitigate harm, mitigate um, and identify harm tipping points. Coherence matters. So that is the meaning making, the coherent narrative. Trauma, the main function of trauma is to break apart and the main function of healing is to put back together and regenerate, right? So how do we reconnect? Collaboration. Um, many of you were just noting partnerships and the need to co-create inclusive resources and response and recovery strategies. So if you are exactly like um, one of you just said, if you are a public health official, you can't do this alone. You have to do this with your school communities and vice versa. Um, consolidation. So consolidation refers to exactly what I'm doing right now. When we're in crisis or when we're in a space of trauma, too much can sometimes create too much. So as leaders, how do we consolidate so that our teams and the folks that we serve and ourselves have a way to focus on the thing in front of us to get to the thing in front of that, to get to the thing in front of that. And then the last part is consent. That's the C word that we often forget about in crisis. Some of us tend to take over or um, respond or show up without the person's consent. And the main word that you, if you may remember from our quote around school crisis leadership was that word of empowerment and the trauma informed principle of collaboration and mutuality. So this crisis leadership readiness, recovery, response and renewal work happens with consent, consent to ourselves and consent with others, right? It's power with versus power over. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it to Oriana. I'm going to um, exit. Please do not exit. Stay with Oriana to close out and so that Oriana can walk you through resources. But um, I know that my colleague is going to hold you in good hands. I'm so grateful for those of you, for all of you. Um, and I will see you in our programming coming up. Oriana, take it away. And you're going to have to unmute Oriana. Still muted. Nope. Okay. 
No, we're still not getting you. Okay, so I'm actually seeing folks exit and I'm gonna do a really quick piece um, because Oriana's having trouble muting and then I will have to exit. I'm seeing some of you exit. Um, so a couple pieces, Jeannie. I'm just, we're gonna move into closing. Um, so we're gonna send out a, um, a evaluation link so that you can fill out an evaluation link and we can continue our funding and continue supporting you really quickly. Um, I just wanted to name, and you'll get this in the follow-up, that we have an open house to learn more about school crisis ready, recovery and renewal coming. Um, you can join our open house this Thursday. You can also join us for a no-cost um, school mental health wellness Wednesday every second Wednesday of each month. Oriana and I will be co-facilitating. We are also doing an SCRR Dia de los Muertos Altar. So if you would like to submit a picture or an art piece of a school or um, person in your school community who has died that you would like to honor and celebrate, um, please, please, please submit by 1027. We're going to create a national, a national altar for a Dia de los Muertos. And then starting on, uh, on uh, October 15th, we're going to be offering some school crisis recovery and renewal foundational modules. So if some of you are like, I am so into this, I want to learn way, 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 way more, please join us. And you can go to our website, schoolcrisishealing.org um, slash events to sign up and register. Uh, Ambrosia is going to join us. And then the last piece is that in November, we're, um, we're having our second free grief Sensitivity Virtual Learning Institute, and it's open to everyone. It's two days. You can come and go to different sessions um, to really elevate our grief sensitivity. There's a clinician track, a school mental health track, and a general track, um, and we hope to see you on the 10th and the, sorry, the 12th and the 13th of November. Um, and uh, Jeannie will make sure that everyone who registered and who showed up for the session gets the links to this, um, get the links to these learning opportunities. So thank you, thank you. Um, and then very last least, last we you have our contact info for both the Pacific Southwest MHTTC and SCRR. You can go to schoolcrisishealing.org to learn more. Oriana, I'm just checking to see if you can unmute and just say, no, okay, we're still unable to unmute. Um, and then uh, again, we'll send out the evaluation link. So Jeannie just put it in the chat box. If you could take five minutes, we're ending 15 minutes early. So it will really, really, really help us if you can, um, if you can fill the evaluation out, just copy paste in your browser. It takes five minutes so that we can continue to get no cost funding. Um, and we are gonna end early. It looks like we're ending early. Isn't that nice to have 15 minutes back in your life? So I'm just going to offer, if everyone wants to put one word, one word that you are leaving this session holding on to. It could be a feeling, it could be a person, it could be a idea, one word. Gratitude, breath, grateful, hope, renewal, inspired, energized, ah, beautiful. Lovely, make space, energized. Subjectivity. Okay. On that note, uh, we're going to close out today. Jeannie, if you can, um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to exit. If you need other pieces to close up um, for the California School Based Health Alliance, please do. Um, and we hope to see you at our upcoming programming. Jeannie will send you this deck, this updated deck. Um, and we're so grateful for you and for this time that you've put into this really big conversation. Lots of breath and water and all the resourcing. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leora.